Blessed are those who feel alone is the theme for today's worship service. As I wrote in the worship email that went out yesterday, I think that feeling alone can mean different things under different circumstances. And it also occurs to me that feeling alone isn't necessarily the same thing as feeling lonely, although the two can certainly coincide. For example, a person could be surrounded by loving family and friends so that they don't feel lonely, and yet they could still feel alone in facing whatever challenge confronts them. Depression, grief, addiction, chronic illness, caregiving for a loved one, or well, I'm sure that you can fill in the blank with one of the many other possibilities. And speaking for myself, I know that I've certainly had the experience of feeling alone in the midst of a group of caring, supportive people. Sometimes when I felt that way, it was because I was facing things I felt others couldn't possibly understand because they probably haven't been through anything similar. One of the dangers with that way of thinking is that it can lead us to retreat even further into our protective shell. And when we do that, we may end up cutting ourselves off from people who actually have had some experience that enables them to empathize and potentially help with our situation. Now, I suspect some of you here know what I'm talking about when I speak about the dangers inherent in cutting oneself off. And if you've ever had an experience of feeling alone in your struggle, though not necessarily lonely, I think that you'll also get what I mean when I say that feelings, yours and mine, are legitimate. That is to say, feelings are a part of our interior experience and nobody inside or outside of our circle has the right to judge us or deny us the right to feel the way that we do. And of course, the same is true vice versa, right? Um, you and I need to be very careful that we don't judge others or, deny, or try to deny them the right to their feelings. Okay, so looking at this week's gospel reading, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, through the lens of our theme, Blessed Are Those Who Feel Alone. I find myself drawn to the verses where the religious leaders cast out of the community the man whose sight has been restored by Jesus. Why do they cast him out? The short answer is they cast him out because he doesn't answer their questions in the way they think he should. They don't, he doesn't tell them what they want to hear. When the man defends Jesus and confesses him to be from God, the religious leaders take offense at what they perceive to be a direct challenge to their authority. I can imagine them with flashing eyes and snarling lips, sneering at this poor man and saying, you were born entirely in sins? And are you trying to teach us? Whew. And then without missing a beat, they cast him out of the community. Now, I think it's helpful for you to know that in the original Greek, the verb our Bible translation renders as drive out actually means cast out. And it's used throughout the New Testament in reference to casting out demons, right? So as I pondered this, I find it quite sobering to realize that the religious leaders perceive this newly healed man to be a demonic danger to their religious community. And I don't think that's too much of a stretch. I'll say more about that in a moment. But I wonder, friends, why is it that we humans have such a hard time being gracious when someone we consider undeserving is given the chance for a better life? I think it's also worth noting that in chapter 10 of John's Gospel, some of the religious leaders accused Jesus himself of having a demon. So in being, so in being perceived as demonic, it would appear that the man in our story is in good company. Okay. Taking a step back and looking at our Gospel 
story um, here through a wider lens, I wonder whether you and I can even begin to fathom the roller coaster of emotions that formerly blind man must have felt. I mean, for one thing, the text reveals that people in those days regarded physical afflictions such as blindness as a divine punishment for sin. So you and I can bet that Jesus' disciples are neither the first nor the last to ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And as the story unfolds, we learn that even the man's own parents don't really understand his pain, and they don't want to speak up for him. As they are publicly confronted by the Pharisees and their whole community, they are no doubt feeling very much alone, ashamed, and afraid. Now imagine how isolated and misunderstood, how utterly alone their son must feel. Even though he's surrounded by others and dependent on them for his very survival. And to be sure, when Jesus first heals him, he probably feels amazed and overjoyed as he dares to hope that his community will no longer regard him as a quote-unquote sinner. Perhaps now that he's healed, they will listen to him, and perhaps he'll no longer feel so ashamed and so alone. But alas, as we've seen, when he finally does speak up, the religious leaders once again accuse him of being a sinner and cast him out, out of the community of God's people, as if he were a demon. In that moment, I can imagine this poor man feeling more alone than ever. But when Jesus hears that the newly sighted man has been cast out, he immediately sets out to find him. And when he finds him all alone on the fringes of the community, Jesus reveals himself to the man who responds with a spontaneous confession of faith. And although the man remains an outcast in the eyes of his religious community, he no longer feels alone, for he is now part of the household of God, together with Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Blessed are those who feel alone, for they will be found by God. What about you, friends? I wonder, when have you felt most alone? Have you ever had an experience of God finding you during a time when you felt especially alone and vulnerable? And if so, how did that experience of being found change you? Or how did it change your life? By the way, that's your takeaway to reflect upon in the coming week. And I'm going to remind you of the questions again in a moment. But first, I want to share a, a rather personal reflection um, based on the same questions. So it might come as a bit of, shock, of a shock to some of you that we pastors often feel alone, even though we're surrounded by people much of the time. There are so many reasons why we feel alone. For one thing, much of what we do isn't visible to our congregations, nor should it be. As a young pastor, I remember people asking me after worship, Sunday after Sunday, so what do you do the rest of the week? <laughs> when I looked at them to see whether they were joking, I realized that they genuinely didn't have a clue. And this was in multiple congregations right? Because I was an interim pastor. I, for 14 years, I went from place to place. Um, I suspect there are still quite a few folks who think that pastors only work on Sundays. Um, <laughs> that'd be a nice gig, wouldn't it? <laughs> besides, besides that, there are also folks who assume that pastors aren't working if we're not physically in the church building. But let me assure you that that's definitely not the case. I mean, 
the work that we're called to do takes us out into the community. Uh, we make visits to hospitals and, and people's homes. We hold off-site sometimes confidential conversations with members and people from the wider community. And in addition, at least for many of us, um, I know I'm not the only one who does this, a lot of our study time and teaching preparation and sermon prep are done at home uh, where there are fewer interruptions. If we're in the office, we know that we're fair game for conversation, and boy, do we love to chat with our congregants. So, Speaking of sermon prep, I suspect that many of you um, think, well, I don't know about you guys, but how many, how many of you think that sermons basically pull a sermon out of the hat every week? <laughs> and the pastors pull... But, um, how much time do you think it takes to, to put a sermon together? Any guesses? Hours. hours. Ten hours. Five, ten? Do I hear 20? Do I hear... So anywhere between 10 and 20 is the typical amount of preparation per week. That's every single week. And since Lutheran congregations tend to emphasize the importance of preaching, I don't see that allocation of time changing in the future. Um, and no, I'm not going to be asking AI to write my sermons. <laughs> but I can't even imagine. Similarly, there are also the written emails, the newsletter articles, the reports, and those aren't something that we just whip out either. Um, we try to be thoughtful with these things. And preparing Bible studies also takes a good chunk of time. And then there are more meetings than one can count. I mean, a touch of humor. When I was ordained in my um, ordination bulletin, there was a marvelous typo. It said, the office of pastor has been committed to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then there are the tasks that get dropped by other people, but are picked up by the pastor because we are the paid staff people, right? Well, maybe not right. In many cases, it's kind of an unspoken expectation that the pastor will pick up those pieces. And I know that I've personally um, felt that pressure, probably internally, um, too, of being the paid staff person. And I picked up someone else's dropped task for the sake of the congregation's ministry. Not surprisingly, that happened more than ever during COVID. But it was already happening before COVID. And it continues to happen as the church with a capital C grapples with its identity and tries to adapt to an ever-evolving world, a world, friends, that needs the good news of God's saving love now more than ever. Now, I know that for some of us, what I'm saying might be an inconvenient and uncomfortable truth, but friends, if you and I can't speak the truth, within the body of Christ, where can we speak it? And if we can't articulate our feelings of aloneness, how can we hope to come together and seek God's help in finding solutions? As members of the church, which is the body of Christ in the world, you need to be aware that pastors are exhausted. We work six and sometimes seven days a week. I know I'm exhausted. And I feel alone at times. And to compound things, I'm often afraid to admit that I feel that way. Why? Because there's also this unspoken expectation that pastors know all the things, can do all the things, and will hold all the things together, right? And such unspoken expectations, whether real or perceived, can cause us pastors to clam up, to put our heads down, and keep working. Often we're too ashamed and afraid to admit to ourselves or to anyone else that we're only human and that we're just not strong enough to do it all by ourselves. But the good news is that God sees us when we're feeling alone and vulnerable. Our compassionate Good Shepherd is always looking for us and reaching out to us in many and various ways. And so here's where I've recently sensed a little bit of divine intervention nudging me out of my place of feeling alone and vulnerable. So just since Monday, I've come across three little written pieces which lead me to realize I'm not alone in feeling alone as a clergy person. Duh. On Monday, I was cleaning out some old papers at home when I came across a magazine from 2018 with the cover article, How Stressed Are Clergy? <laughs> okay. And then on Thursday, a few of my colleagues shared on Facebook and this is a content warning. 
about suicide. They shared a post about the Reverend Anna Matthews, a popular young clergywoman who pastored St. Benet's Anglican Church in Cambridge, England. And tragically, Anna died by suicide on March 9th after succumbing to the relentless pressures of parish ministry. In the social media comments, I was stunned to see that several ELCA pastors had written, that could have been me. And then on Friday, our bishop, Lori Larson Caesar, sent this note in her weekly email to the congregations across the Oregon Synod. Lord, Pastor, bishop Lori writes, we here in the bishop's office are hearing from many of you about how weary many of our leaders are. Please know that we are sending prayers for your health, breath, and life in all its fullness. Please let your lay leaders know that we are holding them in prayer as well, as we all emerge a bit tender from some challenging years. And do not hesitate to reach out to me if there's any way I can be of support. We have been called for such a time as this to be grounded and gracious for the sake of God's love. With you on the way, Bishop Lori L. Caesar. In closing, I just want to repeat your takeaway questions once more. When have you felt most alone? Have you ever had an experience of God finding you and blessing you? During a time you felt especially alone and vulnerable? And if so, how did that experience of being found and blessed change you or change your life? As I said last week, you're obviously free to choose whether and with whom you will share your experience, but I can promise you that if you do choose to share, there will be blessing through the honesty of sharing. Blessed are we who feel alone, because even in those moments when you and I can't see it, our Good Shepherd is here with us, providing all we need for abundant life. Amen. Amen.